Okay. So I'll give you like three minutes for your attempt. Don't try to fully solve the question. Uh, the attempt is more important for me for the time being. So just try it that way within three minutes. Then we will continue with the properties of the Fourier transform. And we will see the property to solve such questions as well. So let's see. A lot of time with this one. Let's continue. Uh, we will come to this question, or the uh, methodology to solve that question, uh, which is the convolution property. Some of you guys may already be familiar with that kind of a thing. But other than that, um, we will come to that. But before that, uh, we have some other properties. In, in fact, we have one other property. Let's first see uh, the remaining, the first of the remaining properties and start by duality. We have previously mentioned about this property of duality. Uh, for example, we said that if you uh, squeeze the um, time signal, you increase the frequency of it, which means the Fourier transform shape expands at the other side. Or if you expand in time, if you ex uh, expand your signal in time, then it means you are lowering the frequency. The period is becoming larger, and the uh, frequency uh, of the, uh, the frequency content of the signal is becoming lower, which means the Fourier transform squeezes at the other side, because uh, lower frequencies are in the center. Now that has a formal relation. Now let's see that. That is called the duality. It is as follows. If x of t has a Fourier transform of capital X of j omega, if you have this kind of a relation, then just take this capital X signal, which was originally on the axis of omega, all right? But replace the omega axis by t. So interpret that signal as a time signal. Let me write it like this, capital X of t. Then. The Fourier transform corresponding to this new time signal is in terms of this lowercase x of t, the original time signal, like this. Lowercase x, uh, but, but within a scale, of course. That is 2 pi, uh, lowercase x of j omega. So what I'm trying to say here is when you take the Fourier transform of a signal, you get another signal. The new axis name is omega, of course, but just assume this as your time signal and replace omega by t, it becomes a time signal then. Or you can interpret it as a time signal. Then the Fourier transform of that will have the same shape as the time signal. Which means you, if you take the Fourier transform of the same signal twice, if you take twice the Fourier transform, you come up with the original signal, x of j omega, but uh, scaled by 2 pi. There's a scaling factor of 2 pi, but it's just a scale. The shape of this twice um, Fourier transform signal is the same as your original. It is quite surprising that such a thing um, has its roots originated from uh, optics. The Fourier transform itself is originated from optics physically. What I mean is this, if you have a lens and if you have an object here, like this, um, we know that at the focal point, th there is a focal point of this lens, you get something which is in, 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 the, in the focus. But uh, if you go the same amount of the focal length, if this is f, for example, if you go for another f, what you get is the same shape, the same image as the original. Of course, it's inverted in optics. 
a lens in such a way uh, <laughs> which has some specific optical names uh, given to that. We don't uh, deal with those uh, optical names for the time being, but at, an ang uh, at a, at a um, distance of f, what you get here is the exact Fourier transform of your original signal, which was the shape of a human. Of course, it was in two dimensions. So this is the Fourier transform that you get physically without doing any computer uh, simulations of MATLAB or anything, you get two-dimensional Fourier transform here. And believe it or not, you can apply a filter here, which is a two-dimensional low-pass filter, high-pass filter, and edge detector, whatever you may think of. And then, if you go F distance more, then you take the Fourier transform again. Th this is the second Fourier transform that you have, and you get the original signal. So the more you uh, propagate along this axis, the more you take the Fourier transforms. And one final um, cultural remark, we are not interested in these. Uh, a scholar may think of such questions, that if this is the first Fourier transform, and if this is the second Fourier transform, then what is going on in between, between zero and F? Because there is some physical, uh, image that can be uh, constructed from here. If you put a piece of paper, for example, over there, you will see something. What is that thing? When you look at, when you put the paper here, you, what you see is the Fourier transform. When you put the paper here, what you see, the image itself. But what, what do you see in between when you put the paper? Fractional Fourier transform. It's not the first Fourier transform, but it is the 0 0.5 Fourier transform in between, for example. That is something very mathematical, and we're not interested in those things. But I'm giving this as uh, a physical um, way of uh, explaining things. Because in the nature, the Fourier transform exists in optics like this. That's an interesting thing. Fortunately, we're not dealing with anything in between. We are only dealing with the first and the second. Fourier transforms, and they are easy. The first Fourier transform is the Fourier transform with the famous integral formula, and the second Fourier transform is when you apply the Fourier transform again, and uh, then you come up with uh, the original signal. And how can we use such things? Uh, does it help us solve any problems in the examinations, for example? And the answer is yes. Um, for example, we know that let me write what we know later. Let, uh, let me first ask you the question. If you have a signal like this, <coughs> this is your signal. What is the Fourier transform of this signal is the question. Now when you look at it, you should immediately see the similarity of this thing uh, that we have seen before. This is a sync signal. And this signal, however, we have seen before in, uh, the, uh, on the frequency axis. The signal that we have previously seen was something like this. I'm going to call it x1 of j omega. And it was 2 sine omega capital T over omega. And we know that this is the Fourier transform of a signal which is x1 of t uh, that is rectangular, 1 when magnitude t is less than capital T and 0 else. So between minus capital T and plus capital T, <coughs> on the time axis it is 1 and uh, out of it it is zeros. So if this is your time signal, we know that this is your Fourier transform. Now I'm asking you uh, a question which just replaced the frequency axis with a time axis like this. Then what is the Fourier transform of this? How do you find it? You find it by looking at the time signal here, the original time signal here, and you just need to replace t by j omega from this property and scale everything by 2 pi. So the answer is x of j omega is equal to quite simply 
2 pi times this thing, 1. But not when t is less than capital T, of course. That's not t anymore. It is omega less than capital T and 0 else, like this, <laughs> which is the same figure. But you just replace t by omega, and you multiply everything by 2 pi. That's how you do it. Otherwise, if you don't use that duality property, you may understand that it is extremely difficult to put this signal into the famous formula of uh, uh, Fourier transform. Multiply this with an e to the minus j omega t and integrate for all t from minus infinity to infinity. Just try to do it. And that will be extremely difficult. And I doubt that you will ever come up with such a simple expression. So what do we learn here? We learn that if your time signal looks like the Fourier transform of some signal, then think of the time signal of that Fourier transform signal you, and use the duality property. Can you think of other examples? For example, what was the Fourier transform of e to the minus t u of t? Take a look at your notes. Hmm? Sir? Uh, it was not square. Uh, it was 1 plus j omega, I guess. So uh, let me then ask you a question like this, generated from here. If x of t is 1 over 1 plus t, what is the Fourier transform of this? 1 over 1 plus t. Exactly. Just this one. e to the minus j omega u of omega. Then you have to put a u of omega here. It's, it's not uh, t anymore. e to the minus j omega u of omega. Uh, times 2 pi, of course. There is a scaling factor of 2 pi from the duality. As simple as that. So sometimes the signal itself may look like the Fourier transform. Then uh, you must... Um, remember immediately this duality property. Now another property. That is the Parseval's relation. Do you remember the Parseval's relation from the Fourier series? It was uh, telling us that the power of your periodic signal can be evaluated in time, uh, like within a period integration of x squared t dt, or you may sum up the uh, Fourier series coefficients squared. That's a similar expression here. Instead of the uh, Fourier series coefficients, we are going to uh, write the Fourier transform. And since we are not talking about not necessarily uh, periodic signals, it is not the power that we uh, evaluate at the left hand side of this equation <coughs> or the relation. It is the energy. So in general, from minus infinity to infinity of the magnitude square of the signal is the energy of the signal. If it is periodic, then you must take the integral within one period and normalize it by the period. That corresponds to the power. If you have a power signal or a periodic signal, then the energy of a power signal is infinity. Okay, Because you're just accumulating all the powers uh, for all periods from ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. And this uh, integration will be infinite. It's not defined that way. But for a normal uh, energy signal, finite signals mostly, then this is the energy that we have is equal to a scale, which is 1 over 2 pi. Such 2 pi and 1 over 2 pi scales always come into the picture because of the definition of the Fourier transform. And times 
the energy on the spectrum axis or the frequency axis. So you may evaluate the energy on the spectrum or on the, uh, over the time domain. How can we use it? Well, we can use it uh, in several ways. For example, in some s uh, for some signals, the time signal is a long thing, or it may be a complicated thing. But the Fourier transform may be compact. For example, if this is a sync signal, what is the Fourier transform of a sync signal from duality? It's a rect signal, rect a rectangular signal. Because the Fourier transform of a rectangle is a sync. From duality, the Fourier transform of a sync is a rectangle. Suppose that your time signal is a sync signal. Uh, how, how can you evaluate this integral? You can do that, but it requires a lot of mathematics in integrals. However, the Fourier transform is just a rectangle. And the square of a rectangle is also a rectangle. And the integral of a rectangle is nothing but the evaluation of an area of a rectangle. Okay, just find the area of that rectangle. That's it. Simple. And you can easily evaluate the energy of a signal by just evaluating the rectangle, uh, the area under a rectangle. Simple. But it may be the opposite. In some cases, this may be complicated and this may be simple. So whichever is simpler or more compact, just choose the domain and evaluate uh, the energy over there. If uh, you, you are required to evaluate the energy, of course. Right? That's how and that's where uh, we use this parcel of theorem. <coughs> Uh, another property, well, these are not properties, they, uh, these are uh, simple observations. If you want to evaluate uh, the initial value, it's not the initial value, but the value of uh, x at 0, that is equal to 1 over 2 pi, the area under the spectrum. This is x0. And the, the dual of this thing is the Fourier transform at omega is equal to 0, which is the DC value. The zero frequency means the offset. The DC value is the area under x of t. These are duals of each other. And uh, they don't even need a proof because they immediately come from the uh, definition of the Fourier transform <coughs> and the inverse Fourier transform because we know that x of j omega is equal to integral x t e to the minus j omega t dt just put omega is equal to zero that e to the minus j omega t becomes one and you get this at omega is equal to zero equivalently x of t is equal to one over two pi integral x of j omega e to the plus j omega t d omega just put t is equal to 0 over there and e to the j omega t will become e to the 0 which is 1 and you get this expression these are simple but it uh, gives uh, s some small observations like this one which may be beneficial in solving some of the uh, problems if you w only need to evaluate the DC coefficient for example you don't really need to evaluate the Fourier transform totally just find the area under your signal that will be uh, your DC as simple as that now finally we are uh, at the property of convolution so this is convolution property and that convolution property is required to solve the quiz question that we first started with and what does it say? It says that uh, if you have x of t convolution with y of t, which is z of t, 
then the Fourier transform of z of t is capital Z of j omega that is equal to in terms of the Fourier transforms of x and y what do we get? from Fourier series uh, it looks similar right? what were we doing? we were multiplying the Fourier series coefficients with the corresponding h of j omega at the corresponding omega at the corresponding frequency <coughs> so what you necessarily do is you multiply the frequency counterparts of x and y which is x of j omega and y of j omega so convolution in time in short is implemented by multiplication in the frequency or in the Fourier domain as simple as that and the proofs of these things are not very much complicated you just need to write the convolution formula here and take the Fourier transform of that large convolution integral a Fourier transform will put another integral so it will be a double integral of something times e to the uh, j omega t minus j omega t then by uh, properly uh, putting the j omega uh, and giving names to different variables by change of variables you will come up with the Fourier transform expression of x times the Fourier transform expression of y it's not very easy but it's not very difficult either I mean you can do that the proof of this one starting immediately from the definitions is not a very difficult thing uh, but again uh, the observation itself is more critical than uh, the way it can be proven okay this is a very important observation that you just need to uh, apply all the time it is telling us that if for example an x of t comes into a signal with, uh, with impulse response h of t then the output y of t which I is normally the convolution of x with uh, h of t but instead of y of t you can evaluate y of j omega the same signal in the frequency domain like x of j omega the Fourier transform of your input times the frequency response of your filter which is the Fourier transform of h of t that is capital H j omega so this gives you the filtering idea the filtering philosophy for instance if, your Fourier if the Fourier transform of your input is something like this all right that is x of j omega on the frequency axis and if your filter is a low pass filter an ideal low pass filter from minus w to w the cutoff frequencies or the frequency axis what is the effect of this filter then over this it is just being applied on top of it and it simply eliminates or chops off these tail portions and it only retrieves the central part which is for this example something like this so this is y of j omega what is the uh, effect that we see uh, when we take a look at y of j omega as compared to x of j omega what is the difference between this one and this one this one has no high frequency content the tail portions as omega increases correspond to higher frequency components harmonics at high frequencies those high frequency harmonics are all gone and we are only getting uh, the output in a frequency range from minus w to w or from zero to w in magnitude so that's why it's a low pass filter and this is an ideal low pass filter by the way can you think of the effects of a band pass filter or high pass filters for example if it's a high pass filter it's just the opposite of this thing depicting only the tail parts and 
suppressing all the low frequency content, making them zero. Something like this, a shape like this. Then the low frequency content will be gone and only high frequency content will be retained. So that is the convolution property. And in terms of the convolution property, we have a cascading property as well. It's a sub-property you may think of. So what I'm saying is uh, x of t convolution with y of t convolution with z of t and by the way it doesn't matter which one you convolve first because they are linear operators okay you may first convolve these two and then the result may be convolved with these two or you may first convolve these two and then convolve the result with this one it doesn't matter or even these two may be convolved first and then the result may be convolved with this one the Fourier transform expression for that one is quite simply x of j omega times y of j omega times z of j omega and for multiplication we also know that it doesn't matter which one you multiply first it's just a series of multiplications so now when we go back to the quiz question the proper way to solve this question, which I'm not going to do, but I, I will uh, show the um, introduction to solve this question. I recommend that you work on it a little bit and try to come up with uh, the result. Is as fo follows. Um, the result is clearly x of t convolution with h1 of t convolution with h2 of t because they are cascaded. So uh, you may start by convolving h1 of t and h2 of t and the effective Fourier transform of the overall expression is the multiplication of h1 of j omega and h2 of j omega. So find the Fourier transform of this h1 of t which is h1 of j omega and we know that it's a sinc function. And we know that e to the minus t u of t has a Fourier transform of 1 over 1 plus j omega. So we have two expressions and they must be multiplied. So it's a sync times uh, or sync over uh, 1 plus j omega sort of thing. And then the Fourier transform of the input. What is that? It's an e to the minus 1.5 j omega. That's an extra term. Just multiply everything. That would correspond to the Fourier transform. Then you may try to invert that multiplication. Of course, uh, if the question asks you what is y of t, then you have to find the inverse Fourier transform of the multiplication in Fourier domain, uh, which I don't know, and I didn't care either. I mean, uh, it may be a little bit difficult, by the way, for this question, but it's not going to be very difficult in the exams. Of course, it may it must be manageable if I ever ask a question like that. So the proper way to, uh, to solve um, cascaded linear filtering problems is by converting everything to Fourier transforms and multiplying in the Fourier transform domain and evaluate the result in the Fourier transform <coughs> then finally find the inverse Fourier transform in the end to find the time domain signal that's how you're supposed to do it oh by the way since it doesn't matter uh, which you multiply first. Uh, it also gives you an, an, another property of uh, linear time invariant systems that you can interchange the places of these two filters. You may apply H2 of t first and then H1 of t, but we already know it from uh, block diagrams, right? In the block diagrams, we were interchanging the places of two systems, uh, both of them being linear and time invariant. So that's another Now the dual of uh, the convolution property, when you uh, combine the convolution property and the duality property, we come up with another property uh, that must be considered by itself separately. So let me ask you this. If there is convolution in time, 
Then the Fourier transform is the multiplication. What can you say about the following? If you multiply two time signals, what can you say about the Fourier transform then? Convolution. Just from duality, it's the convolution, but this 1 over 2 pi thing comes into the picture here. So within a scale, it is x of j omega convolution with y of j omega. But notice that this convolution operation is on the axis of omega, on the axis of frequency. These two s things are signals themselves. You must plot them on the frequency axis, two signals, this one and this one. You just need to convolve them in their own domain. And this is the multiplication property. Now, this multiplication property, that is uh, the multiplication of two signals versus convolution of the Fourier transforms of these signals, is encountered in a, a very important application that is called modulation. For those of you who have previously seen uh, communication systems courses, it may happen like when you fail from this one once and then proceeding to the communications and then taking this course again, for example, that may be possible. Over there you, you might have heard about this modulation. What does it mean, by the way? Uh, is there anybody who knows uh, or who has a sense of modulation, no, knows something about modulation? Just raise your hands. I'm not going to ask anything further. A few only. So I have to explain that. It's a minority. Modulation is uh, the shifting of the frequency co content of a low-pass signal, which is also known as a baseband signal, like my speech. Because voice is between 20 hertz, audible voice is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. Okay, that's the range that our ears can hear. Out of it, we cannot hear. But uh, no matter how much you shout, uh, on the, even on the open air, it may go to perhaps a kilometer, right? So to communicate l at long distances, the only way to do it is to carry this low-pass signal, my voice, to a very high frequency, which can't be heard by human beings. It's a radio signal. It becomes a radio signal. Then it may be transmitted to very long distances. It can go anywhere. There are se several famous methods to uh, uh, push the frequency content from 20 kilohertz maximum to megahertz or gigahertz. There are several methods. All those methods are known as modulation met methods. And the famous modulation uh, methods that we have are, th the two of the most famous linear modulation techniques are amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. I'm sure uh, you are more familiar with the term FM, right? Yeah, most of the current radio technology is using frequency modulation because of some reasons uh, that will be explained in the communication systems courses. Uh, but uh, this one is a little bit more complicated as compared to the amplitude modulation. The amplitude modulation is quite simply uh, using this multiplication property. What we are trying to do is we are trying to multiply x of t with a high frequency uh, sinusoid. Let's call it cosine <coughs> omega c t. Omega c is a very high frequency and this subscript c has a meaning. It means carrier frequency. So this is the carrier frequency which is megahertz. Now this multiplication has this kind of an effect. The cosine is a lower frequency signal as compared to this. Uh, th this x of t is very low frequency as compared to this cosine. And the situation is like this. If your x of t is slowly varying low frequency signal like this, when you multiply it with a cosine, the result will look like this. <coughs> 
All right? Because this cosine frequency, this cosine is a more frequent signal, higher frequency signal as compared to this x of t. And can you guess why the name is AM, amplitude modulation? Because look at the amplitude following the peaks of these things. So the radio for an am amplitude modulation is just detecting these peaks, envelope in other words. Uh, and that is the amplitude modulation. So what does it correspond to in the Fourier domain? In the Fourier domain it corresponds to uh, uh, the Fourier transform of X is X, capital X of J omega. And so excuse me, I'm saying convolution. I'm sorry about this. I'm getting confused here. It's a multiplication. It's a multiplication of X and cosine. Sorry about that. So this is the multiplication. The figure is correct. But since it's multiplication in time, it must correspond to a convolution in the frequency domain. And uh, the convolution result at the right hand side is the Fourier transform of a cosine. Do we, do we know the Fourier transform of a cosine? It is uh, w with a 1 over 2 delta omega minus omega c plus delta omega plus omega c. Two impulses with a magnitude of uh, 1 over 2. So we have this impulse and we have this impulse. These two impulses uh, will have to be convolved with x of j omega. And do you remember how to convolve with an impulse? What were we doing when we are convolving with an impulse? Yeah, just carrying the signal, this one, to the position of this impulse, shifting it by that amount. That's it. It's not a very complicated operation. The result is 1 over 2 with a 1 over 2 pi, so it becomes 1 over 4 pi in the end x of j omega convolution delta omega minus omega c is x of j omega minus omega c plus x of j omega plus omega c. What does it mean? If x of j omega is originally a low pass signal, usually it's represented like this triangle, band limited, When you multiply with a cosine, which means modulation, that's the name by the way. <coughs> Let's assume omega c is somewhere here, which is not very uh, visually correct. Usually that omega c is far away from this blackboard, okay? But I'm just trying to illustrate it. This triangle is carried to, to the right, like this. That corresponds to x of j omega minus omega c, around omega c. And it's also carried to the left, around minus omega c. Now this signal can't be heard because omega c is a very high frequency. And it has some physical properties which can propagate to long distances. That is the uh, flavor of telecommunications. <laughs> okay, that's how you do telecommunications. Now, uh, I, I'm going to give you a break, but in the break, I urge you to think of the following. How can you demodulate? This is the transmitter side. In the transmitter side, I have a microphone taking this, multiplying with a cosine, so the spectrum becomes this, and it's being transmitted. And now you have a radio at home, and in your radio, you want to tune the, to this omega C. Suppose this omega C is known. That's the uh, radio uh, station frequency, 100.5 megahertz, for example. So you know omega c. If you know omega c, can you think of a demodulation method to listen to this signal, to come back to here from this modulated signal? Please think of it. And after the break, we will see uh, how to do that. Okay.